From a and this is Biography. Blanche Dubois, Stanley Kowalski, Big Daddy, all of them born in the fertile brain of Tennessee Williams. All the material comes from the back of my head and right through my fingers onto the electric cord of it. I never lied in my heart. His work is so powerful that he came along once in a, in a century. He shocked audiences and rescued an art form. He kept the American theater alive almost single-handedly during the 50s and early 60s. Until he was ridiculed as a has-been. The critics murdered him, literally murdered him. And finally destroyed himself. He was, alas, one of the first casualties of alcoholism and drug addiction. Genius is a word that should, without a shred of doubt, be applied to Tennessee Williams. Cornelius Williams descended from an illustrious Tennessee family, but loud, hard-drinking, a ladies' man. Edwina Williams, daughter of a minister, mentally unstable, sexually repressed. Their son, Tennessee, inherited the best and the worst from both. In March 1911, he was born Thomas Lanier Williams in Columbus, Mississippi. Tom spent his infant years in this home belonging to the Episcopal Church, where his grandfather was a highly respected minister. Edwina stayed home and doted on Tom and his older sister, Rose. Cornelius, a traveling salesman, was usually out of town. The marriage was a marriage made in hell, and he was happiest out on the road with the boys, playing poker and uh, probably dallying a bit with the ladies, too, of the evening. And when Cornelius was home, he bullied and terrorized his wife and young children. Edwina ignored her husband, reserving her affection for Tom and Rose. But she was also controlling, warning that any misbehavior would be punished by God. When Tom was four years old, the family moved to Clarksdale, another town in Mississippi. Already a needy child, Tom needed even more when he fell deathly ill. My brother was a victim of diphtheria, and for a year he wasn't able hardly to get out of the house. His legs were practically skin and bone. He couldn't hardly walk. But he could discover the world of words. His mother introduced him to writers like Shakespeare and Dickens. During Tom's two-year illness, Edwina Williams grew even more protective of her frail son. Tom also spent hours with his sister Rose. The two became inseparable best friends. Then, in 1918, Tom's world was turned upside down. His father got a new job with the International Shoe Company. The Williams family was uprooted from rural Mississippi to St. Louis one of the largest cities in America. Williams hated the town and his new school, which he compared to a jail. His misery was compounded because his incompatible parents were now under the same roof in this apartment building. In 1919, there was a third child, Dakin, and money was tight. Every month, at the end of the month, when the bills came in, there was a Donnybrook in our house because my father was very bombastic around the house and would shout at my mother, would shout at my sister. Tom withdrew deeper into his private oasis of poetry and novels. For a boy who was shy to the point of pain and sensitive to what then might have been called effeminacy, he was almost brutalized by schoolboys and this was reinforced at home because his father couldn't stand the fact that he didn't turn into a football hero. The boy preferred to read poetry. 
Tom was ridiculed by his macho dad, who mocked him as a sissy and wondered whether he was raising a homosexual. Mom wasn't a model parent either. She was manipulative, continually warning her children about men like their father. The mother could at times be extremely difficult, being very puritanical about sex. And of course, the effect on the children was divisive, was destructive. Rose and Tom found solace in each other. They played together, then when they were old enough, went to movies together at the local theater. They were similar in personality, best friends, and soulmates. Rose was his one really great love. It was one to whom he was at all times faithful, as he was to his writing. They were the two major forces in his life. But in her late teens, Rose began showing signs of mental problems, violent mood swings, hysterical crying, adding even more tension to the home. The breaking point came one night when Tom assaulted Rose with his most dangerous weapon, his words. My brother met her coming down the stairs and said, I never want to see your ugly face again. And that was a, 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 a tremendous blow, uh, because my sister at that time was just wavering between sanity and insanity. And the next day, she took a carving knife and went after my father with it. Eventually, the family had Rose Williams committed to a mental hospital. Tom was devastated, and for the rest of his life feared that he too might go mad. Fortunately, there was an outlet, writing. He became more serious about it at age 19, when he entered the University of Missouri. Tom wrote poetry. A kiss brings pain, and yet I'll kiss again. His father wasn't exactly proud. Tom's prowess in poetry was nothing to brag about at poker games. And Cornelius Williams flew into a rage when Tom flunked ROTC military training. He felt his son was a disgrace to the family, not a real man. He yanked Tom out of college and put him to work at International Shoe. By day, 21-year-old Tom stacked boxes in this warehouse in St. Louis. By night, he wrote. His tools were a typewriter, coffee, cigarettes, and persistence. He typed ferociously on the typewriter, and he just pounded them, and uh, he'd, he'd turn out a page in about a minute. And then he'd be dissatisfied and tear it out and I put another one in and type furiously again, uh, maybe the same page 15 times, <laughs> until everything was exactly right. After three years in the shoe factory, Tom entered Washington University in St. Louis. At 24, he was one of the oldest students on campus. In 1936, he won first prize of $25 in a poetry competition. For the first time, Tom felt he might actually have real talent. So he entered one of his plays in a university drama contest. When it got fourth place, Tom's ego was crushed. He screamed at his professor, quit school, and stormed off campus. He wrote about himself, angry and bored. Wonder if I shall end up like Rose. The next year, 1937, it was on to college number three, the University of Iowa. Once again, he wrote plays and acted in a student production. This time, he even graduated. And he decided Thomas Lanier Williams just wasn't a suitable name. So he named himself after the state settled by some of his ancestors. From now on, he would be Tennessee Williams. It was also time to move away from home. After considering a few possibilities, he decided to try his luck in New Orleans. In 1938, the day after Christmas, Tennessee Williams arrived in his new city, ready to begin a new life. New Orleans was known as a place where just about anything went. One of the first things to go was his virginity. Tennessee quickly realized he preferred the company of men. I entered the deck. He preferred the company of men. I 
better in the decadent world of New Orleans. <laughs> then I discovered a certain uh, flexibility in my sexual nature, shall I say. <laughs> he also discovered poverty. But when things seemed hopeless, one of his plays won a contest and a first prize of $100. Far more important, the award caught the attention of Audrey Wood, a highly respected literary agent. She convinced him New York City was the only place for a serious American dramatist. Tennessee Williams was persuaded to head north to the theater capital of America. In the first week of 1940, 28-year-old Tennessee Williams arrived in New York City. He was entranced by the theater district and the marquees that lit up the Great White Way. He soon made a new circle of friends, many of them other writers from the South, many of them homosexual. I've never known anyone who accepted being homosexual more and who really believed a day was lost if he didn't get in bed with somebody. The day was also lost if he didn't write. Tennessee wasn't concerned with the mundane aspects of life, things like eating or shopping, but he did care about his work. In 1942, Tennessee Williams and his friend Donald Wyndham wrote a play called You Touched Me. He just worked practically all the time. He would work eight hours typing away, you know, every now and then cracking his knuckles when he got nervous. As in New Orleans, Williams was constantly broke. That changed abruptly in the summer of 1943. The playwright took a train to Hollywood and instant riches. His agent, Audrey Wood, landed Williams a job as a scriptwriter with MGM. He called his new employer Metro Goldmine Mayor. He went right out of poverty into having $250 a week, and to him, this was incredible. And unlike what you might have expected, he did not go Hollywood. Meaning, Tennessee kept working on serious plays, even while enjoying the beach and a fat paycheck. One of his works, The Gentleman Caller, was based on his controlling mother and mentally ill sister. At the time, Rose Williams was in a Missouri mental hospital. But her screaming fits ended in 1943 when she underwent an experimental new treatment, a lobotomy. Tennessee Williams' cherished sister would never be the same. I asked him once, how is Rose now? And his response was, well, she's tranquil. See, and that was his, he didn't want to go beyond that. The same year Rose was lobotomized, Williams submitted the play about his sister to MGM. The studio rejected the gentleman caller as unsuitable for a movie. Tennessee then rejected Hollywood as unsuitable for his own mental health. In late 1943, Williams returned to New York with a bulging bank account and a new play with a revised title. The gentleman caller was now The Glass Menagerie. Audrey Wood passed the script around, and it was eventually read by the legendary stage actress Lorette Taylor, who felt the part of Amanda could put her back in the spotlight. Amanda was a fading Southern belle, abandoned by her husband, desperate to marry off her disabled daughter. We're gonna get you married. But, Mother, I'm crippled. Don't use that word. He'd just have a slight defect, that's all. Hardly noticeable. The Glass Menagerie opened at Chicago's Civic Theater, winning critical praise. But the true test came when it moved to New York City in April 1945. Broadway was crowded with musicals and light comedies, but few serious plays. And nothing quite like The Glass Menagerie, with its blend of poetic language and naked emotion. Tom! Yes, Mother? Where are you going? I'm going out. Walk out just the way your father did. We'll manage without you. I'm strong enough to take care of Laura. You can go to the moon, you selfish dreamer. 
the real life dreamer had no idea what to expect. He attended opening night with Donald Wyndham. We were mainly aware of people coughing and things like that. What Tennessee and I talked about when we walked around the streets afterwards was whether the coughing was what people do on first nights or admits the audience was bored and how could one tell from that what the critics were going to say. What many of them said was that Menagerie was a masterpiece. At age 34, Tennessee Williams had a hit play and the acceptance he never got at home. But he felt little satisfaction, fearing he would be a one-hit wonder. In January of 1946, the suddenly famous playwright returned to this apartment in New Orleans, the city he found most conducive to writing. He began work on a play about another faded Southern belle named Blanche Dubois, and named it after the streetcar that ran past his apartment, a streetcar named Desire. The play's power and William's reputation convinced Elia Kazan to sign on as director. Kazan and Williams then gambled on some unknown actors, Marlon Brando to play tough guy Stanley Kowalski, Kim Hunter as his wife Stella. I had no notion what I was getting into. <laughs> had no notion that it would be the play of the century <laughs> that I was involved with, none at all. Even more than Menagerie, a streetcar named Desire explored uncharted and forbidden territory. This is a story of a stud who beats up his pregnant wife, rapes his sister-in-law, and holds the pair of them in economic bondage. I mean, people that have never seen anything like this on stage. I asked him, could you give me an idea of what you consider the theme of the play? And he said, well, he said, I think it's a plea for the understanding of the delicate people. And I think the plea is also to understand him. Williams had the uncanny ability to write equally well for men and women. I think that duality of gender is very useful to a writer. He can write both from a male point of view and a female point of view, or in between. He had what you'd call two personalities, a male personality similar to Stanley Kowalski, and a uh, female type of personality inside of him, which enabled him to, uh, to live the life of Blanche in his mind. What'd you smash the bottle for? So I could twist the broken end in your face. I bet you would do that. I would. I will. Oh, you want some rough house, sir. All right, let's have a little rough house. We've had this state with each other from the beginning. It was such a tremendous play. So powerful. The audience was quiet. We didn't know whether they really liked it or didn't like it. They were just stunned. They liked it. The audience gave Williams a standing ovation. Later, one of the guests at the opening night party was famed playwright Thornton Wilder. He said that he thought for theater, at any rate, that the character of Blanche was simply too complex. And Tennessee said, but Thornton, people are complex. The reviews for Streetcar went beyond smashing. There were more awards and even a Pulitzer Prize. Theater goers lined up for tickets, and Tennessee Williams was the sensation of Broadway. But there was a downside. Audiences and critics demanded more, more magic, more masterpieces. Tennessee Williams felt the weight of everyone's expectations. He would soon search for relief in the bottle and the bedroom. Famed young playwright Tennessee Williams returns from abroad on the Queen Elizabeth. Williams is back in New York for the Radio City Music Hall opening of the Warner Brothers motion picture version of his critics' prize play, The Glass Menagerie. ...version of his critics' prize play, The Glass Menagerie. Not yet 40 years old, Tennessee Williams was America's most famous playwright. 
the plays that took Broadway by storm were now being turned into Hollywood spectaculars. Mother, what are you doing? Improvements. They're called gay deceivers. I won't wear them. You will. Why should I? Because to be painfully honest, honey, you're just as flat. The movie version of A Streetcar Named Desire again starred Marlon Brando and Kim Hunter. The lighting crew that are way up above, you never meet them. One of these chaps up there leaned over and said, Hey, who wrote this thing? And we yelled up, Tennessee Williams. He said, Wow. He said, I've been in the business 25 years. He said, I don't go to movies. This one I want to see. The movie had to be sanitized for the screen and the rape scene removed, but it remained powerful. Hey, you got plenty of room to get by me now. Come on. You think I'm going to interfere with you? Meanwhile, Tennessee Williams was in love. In late 1948, he started seeing Frank Merlo, a former sailor with a charismatic personality. The two men moved in together. It would be Tennessee Williams' one and only enduring relationship. Merlot organized their lives, allowing Williams to concentrate on writing. Frank once said very plaintively, Tom can't accept how much I love him. That's a very sad commentary, because Frank Merlot really gave his whole life uh, to a loving of this very wounded genius that was Tennessee Williams. Williams devoted that genius to the theater. In 1951, he had another hit with The Rose Tattoo, starring Eli Wallach as a truck driver in love with an immigrant widow. Every other night, Tennessee would come in with a new ending. He was not happy with the ending of that play. And he'd say, I, I think I found it now. But it took him almost three weeks to find what he wanted. Wallach then starred in a more experimental Williams play called Camino Real. It was a critical and commercial flop. But Williams could ignore the poor reviews. He was barely 40, with plenty of time and energy. He was dubbed by one of his friends as Tendacity Williams. He could have a hangover, a, a fight or, with his lover. Um, he would get up in the morning and he would go to his typewriter. Those hangovers were becoming more frequent. Williams came from a long line of heavy drinkers and was following the family tradition. He dealt with alcoholism in his next play, about a drunk ex-football hero and his sex-starved wife. I feel all the time like a cat on a hot tin roof. Then jump off the roof, Maggie, jump off it. On stage and on film, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof was filled with unforgettable characters and overflowing with sexual tension. When a marriage goes on the rocks, the rocks are there, right there. Cat on a Hot Tin Roof earned Williams more rave reviews, more awards. Critics were in love with his language. Williams was considered playwright and poet. He was a wordsmith. He was very particular about how he put them together. Often he would scratch out a line, scratch out a word, and get it right. Gee golly gosh. He wanted that gee golly gosh rhythm, and finally he worked about ten times until he got it. We'd go to see a play like, say, Cat, and he'd sit there and chuckle and laugh. And he, he loved his work. He loved what he did. And his laugh was just like a maniacal laugh. <laughs> And he'd be in the theater. I'd be in the theater with him right in the, in the back. And he would, this hyena laugh in the wrong places. And people in front would turn around like, how dare you, you know. In the 1950s, Williams and Frank Merlot began spending most of their time in Key West, not yet a major tourist attraction. In 1955, Williams was in Key West when a telegram arrived. He had won another Pulitzer Prize for Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. That same year, he finished his only work written specifically for the screen. Baby Doll starred Carol Baker and Eli Wallach. This is the 19-year-old Baby Doll. She wouldn't let her husband come near her. She wouldn't let the stranger go away. Oh, Mr. McCarroll, you're certainly all getting familiar. 
Do you have any fun loving spirit about you? Well, this... I thought it was a rather innocent movie about getting revenge. But when the reviews came out, it, it, it was so. This is the most pornographic. Well, I couldn't believe it. The Catholic Legion of Decency gave the film a rating of C for condemned. Francis Cardinal Spellman denounced Baby Doll from the pulpit of St. Patrick's Cathedral, calling it morally repellent. Cardinal Spellman was asked, Did you see the movie? He said, No. If the water supply is poisoned, why would I drink it? Well, that was, I thought, well, I didn't ask him to drink poisoned water, Let's just to see. go see the movie. The controversy focused attention on Baby Doll and helped make it a hit. Some critics called it one of the year's best movies. Williams was also working on another controversial play. Sweet Bird of Youth dealt with an aging movie queen and her affair with a young gigolo. He decided to preview the play at Studio M Playhouse in South Florida. Every day, the director, George Keithley, went to Williams' hotel room to pick up the latest version of the script. These are Williams' actual notes and revisions. Keithley noticed the playwright was drinking more, and earlier. One time he had a, a tumbler full of bourbon. And this is at 10 o'clock in the morning. And I said, Tennessee, why do you do that? Why do you, why do you drink so much? And he said, well, because someday when I don't have this, and he pointed to all the writing, he said, I'll have this. Sweet Bird of Youth eventually moved to Broadway and the movies. It is a rare appearance in a premiere for the master storyteller, who in Sweet Bird of Youth added another absorbing drama to his list of successes. Williams received nearly a half million dollars for the film rights. By now, his reputation for racy material was used to help promote a movie. Never before, even in the strange world of Tennessee Williams, has there been anyone like Chance Wayne and the women who wanted him? Oh, that feels so... I don't remember your face, but your hands are familiar. Meanwhile, the real-life world of Tennessee Williams was a mess. He and Frank Merla were arguing more and more, and Williams was unfaithful with faithful regularity. When it came to sex, he was addicted to the kindness of strangers. Tennessee always had an eye open for some uh, good-looking young man. And uh, he the younger, the better. After numerous separations, Williams and Merlo split for good in 1962. Soon after, Merlo learned he had lung cancer. In the summer of 1963, Frank Merlo died, taking with him a part of Tennessee Williams. Tennessee said, uh, I have been in a deep depression since Frankie's death. And he was, I mean, and you could just see it. He, he, could hardly, he, he was rendered almost immobile. Uh, that's another thing that drove him into these kinds of drugs and, and, and stuff to obliterate that pain. There was more pain to come. The great writer would soon be considered a washed up has-been. And the critics who made him were about to break him. Since man has known woman, there has never been such a night. In 1964, another Tennessee Williams play was turned into a steamy film. The Night of the Iguana featured religion, guilt, and, of course, sex. Iguana was widely praised, but Williams' glory days were nearing an end. Now in his early 50s, he was taking huge amounts of sleeping pills, washing them down with wine or gin. Williams still stumbled to the typewriter every morning, but often walked away with a blank page. He sought help from a psychiatrist who had a novel suggestion. He told him to stop being a homosexual. I mean, you can't do that to a person who is a born homosexual. You suddenly can't go to the shrink and say you want to get well. You start sleeping with a woman. <laughs> I mean, it made, it made no sense at all. In addition to the pills, alcohol, and dubious advice, in addition to the pills, alcohol, and dubious advice, there were reviews that seemed to get worse with each new play. Slapstick tragedy was called bizarre. 
The Seven Descents of Myrtle was ridiculed as the Several Descents of Tennessee. And a critic called another play, William's Monster. Just as he had been rejected by his father long ago, Williams was now being rejected by the theater. The critics murdered him, literally murdered him, mercilessly. And um, that was very hard on him. I think they killed him. I it would hurt. Think they, it I, hurt. Sure, they drove him right back to drink and drugs. Through it all, Williams remained eternally loyal to his lobotomized sister Rose, still in a nursing home. He paid all her bills and occasionally brought her to his plays. Ever since Rose's madness, Williams had been terrified of going insane himself. The alcohol and drugs were now leading to full-blown paranoia. He would call me, like he called me from uh, Key West one evening. He said, Dakin, an attempt will be made on my life tonight. So I said, well, Tom, I call him Tom still, uh, I can't possibly get to Key West tom uh, tonight. Well, well, tomorrow will be all right. And so he says, yes, yes, come tomorrow. So he knew that if an attempt were made on his life that night, it would most likely be unsuccessful. So. <laughs> Dakin Williams, a Roman Catholic, convinced his brother religion was the answer. Tennessee agreed to be baptized in Key West but soon disavowed the ceremony. Then, Dakin took a more drastic step. In 1969, he checked his brother into Barnes Hospital in St. Louis, the psychiatric ward. He was diagnosed there as dying of acute drug poisoning. And so I had no choice but to, uh, to keep him in. And so I, I kept him in for three months until I totally dried him out. Mr. Tennessee Williams. After his release, Tennessee Williams went on national television. The David Frost show, uh, Tennessee was clearly drunk. And it was one of the few times that anybody ever saw him swish. Drunk or not, Tennessee bragged about his newfound sobriety. Right. I'm on the wagon now, and I must say it feels very strange. You've given it up. I allow myself one drink a day. And you've given up? Sleeping pills as well? Yes, I had to give them up. I'm just uh, on myself now. <laughs> and Frost was egging him on, trying to get him to talk about his homosexuality. H how about the things like the homosexuality and so on? Does everybody live the with that too? Williams dodged the issue, then came up with a one-liner that delighted the audience. <laughs> but I've covered the waterfront. <laughs> Williams kept his drinking and pill-popping in check, at least temporarily. But Broadway producers were unwilling to risk their money on his plays. Williams was forced to work in small theaters, far from the Great White Way. In 1971, at age 60, Williams decided to collaborate again with director George Keithley on Tennessee's new play, Outcry. He became extraordinarily paranoid. He became very aggressive in, in all the wrong ways, very defensive, very difficult to work with. One day he unleashed that aggression on his agent, Audrey Wood. She had nurtured his career for a quarter century, but in 1971, during rehearsals for Outcry, he fired her. And he whirled at her and he said, and you, you bitch. He said, you've been against me from the beginning. He said, I want nothing more to do with you. I mean, the whole room was stunned. Audrey didn't know what to say. She was deeply, deeply, deeply hurt. The actress Ann Jackson also felt the Williams sting when she went to meet with him in a New York hotel. He was drinking and he had a young boy up in the hotel room. I was so ashamed for this young boy who was just sitting in the room and not part of the conversation. And I tried to bring him into the conversation and Tennessee got very nasty and said, would you like to go into the bedroom with him? And of course I was, I was so upset by the way he was treating me, he could just rip you apart. The downward spiral continued, but the man known as Tenacity Williams wasn't quite ready to surrender. In 1972, 
After years of writing nothing but flops, Tennessee Williams was ready to try again at the age of 61. His newest play, Small Craft Warnings, was staged in a tiny theater in downtown Manhattan. But this play is the publicity campaign included a press conference that was painful to watch because of Williams' obvious drunkenness. Because, darling, you have weren't so, I won't say gone damn, unless you let me. Is it all right? You weren't so gone damn hard, love. It's beautiful. Thank you. I don't think you know how much I love actors. They're my life. They're the blood that keeps me alive. Actors like you and like Candy. Williams himself acted in the play, but it was ridiculed by audiences and critics alike. Even his friends debated whether Williams' magic touch had vanished forever. I'm always amazed at people who claim that the plays never got less good, because I think they did, and I think Tennessee knew it. And it, it, yes, it more or less did him in. As far as his being a failed playwright, believe me, it was more the people among his friends and among critics who failed him. But no matter how bad the reviews, Williams never stopped writing and never stopped believing the next play would be the one. I doubt that I can write a play that will become a classic, but I can write a successful play if I'm given a chance to. After all, I'm not senile, I don't believe. <laughs> one final blow came in 1980. Williams had great expectations for his play, Clothes for a Summer Hotel. But when it opened in Washington, one reviewer called it vacant. Another said the play was illiterate, and Williams fired back. And I wrote him. <laughs> I'm sick of some, some of those critics. I won't take that shit no more. You can keep that in, too. <laughs> On the record. <laughs> His heart was broken, and I think when that last play failed, uh, that was it for him. He felt that there was no hope. In early 1983, Williams seemed to give up. He had absolutely no energy, nothing left to offer. On a visit to New York, he checked into the Elysee Hotel, which he called the Easy Lay because of his many sexual encounters there. On the night of February 24th, Williams went to his room, which was well stocked with wine and sleeping pills. The next morning, he was found dead at age 71. The announcement came on the radio first. By afternoon, before the body was finally removed from the hotel, the street was clogged so traffic could not get through. I think he himself would have been more amazed at this spectacle. Broadway's greatest stars were in shock. I don't feel as much sorrow that he is dead as as much joy that he lived. According to the autopsy, Williams choked on a small cap from a plastic bottle of barbiturates. It's an explanation his brother has never accepted. First of all, it was too small to block the air passage and had absolutely nothing to do with his death. And where there's a cover-up, there has to be a reason for the cover-up. And the reason was that he was murdered. Dakin Williams believes his brother was killed because he was about to change his will. Many others feel it was a form of suicide. In fact, he took his own life. How deliberately, we don't know, but he took enough drugs deliberately that reveal to us the depth of despair with which he clearly had lived his final months. He wanted to close the door, and finally he did so. Close friends argue that the actual cause of death was slow torture, administered by critics. I think Tennessee was martyred by the bad reviews and, the, and kind of humiliated publicly by critics who just didn't kind of humiliated publicly by critics who just didn't understand. And then came all the obits 
with the great praise. And I would like to take the noses of those who, who were on the destructive hunt and stick it in the, in the obituaries and let them read what, what a heritage this man left. Williams was buried in St. Louis, the city he associated with his lonely childhood, violent family quarrels, and his sister's descent into madness. It was also the city where Williams collected the raw material he shaped into his masterpieces, the plays powerful enough to stir the human soul. I sent him a little gift once, and when the saleswoman said, where should I send it? I said, Tennessee Williams, and, uh, and she said, Tennessee Williams, and she just grabbed her heart. And I thought, you know, that's what he did to people. The woman who grabbed Tennessee's heart is also dead. In September 1996, Rose Williams died in her nursing home. She was 87. Brother and sister, once inseparable, are together again. Their graves just a few feet apart in a St. Louis cemetery. On Rose's headstone, a line from the glass menagerie. Blow out your candles, Laura. Tennessee's other great love, his work, is very much alive. His plays continue to captivate audiences around the world. Not just the famous ones, but also the experimental works that were so widely ridiculed. Since he died, more and more of those little old, little plays toward the end of his life have been produced and people saying, wow, that's better than I thought it was. When you come down to it, he is one of the great literary figures of this century and he will last for quite a while into the millennium. I think you see his plays. Tennessee Williams was blessed with the gift to arouse and inspire. His happiest moments were spent creating, using his typewriter as a painter uses a brush. You have to have the spark of genius, which he has. That's what a great artist is. You have those people doing that on a canvas, and you have them doing it with words. And my brother was, I think, the greatest. And always will be. I always used to say of him, he's piped in. Tennessee just piped directly into God with that kind of stuff. How else does that come out? God's at work somewhere, they're doing that. Tennessee Williams left behind theatrical classics. They earned him praise and adulation as the century's greatest playwright. He personally felt the extremes of ecstasy and torment, then put them in words and on stage for others to see, to hear and most of all, to feel. I often wonder, how can anybody like me? And yet, occasionally I discover that somebody does. 